everyone, and welcome to today's nonprofit show podcast. We are excited to be joined again with our great friend, Jeff Hensel from I Bailey, and we're continuing our conversation that we've been engaged in all week about AI in nonprofits. And this is a special asked and answered edition where we're going to move beyond the conversations that we've had in the earlier part of the week and actually dive into some of the nitty gritty of the questions that you, the listeners and the viewers have sent in. And so we're excited to, to dive into that. Um, and we're excited to have Jeff with us as well. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to take a listen or look at those episodes, we invite you to take a look at the archives and get all caught up um, and get all of the wonderful tidbits that have been shared throughout this week. So uh, as we get moving here, I wanna make sure that I give some love to our sponsors um, who have made this, um, possible. Um, so we have Bloomerang, we have the Nonprofit Academy, we have Staffing Boutique, Your Nonprofit Controller, um, Fundraisers Friday, uh, and we also have uh, with us the Nonprofit Thought Leader. So we want to thank all of you for making um, this show possible and for this particular Asked and Answered. And so I am Miko Marco Whitlock, one of your many amazing co-hosts who is going to be facilitating this conversation today um, with Jeff. And so with that, Jeff, can you remind us where are you joining us from today and remind us about your role at, at Odd Bailey? Absolutely, Miko, and thank you uh, for the introduction and I'm happy to be here again today. Um, Jeff Hensel at, from Odd Bailey, I am in Fargo, North Dakota, is uh, the headquarters of Odd Bailey. And uh, I, my role at iBailey is really around helping clients with their digital future and helping them understand, especially with things like advanced technologies, things like AI, uh, how that impacts them, how they need to think about it and how they develop strategies around it to, to get the most out of it. Well, awesome. Well, we are, are, are excited to have you this week and excited to have you here today to continue this conversation about AI and to really dive into the question. So. I guess I just have one simple question before we move forward, Jeff. Like, are are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Well, let's, let's do it. Go. So let's let's go ahead and dive into the first question that we have here. And so we know that we've had a, a a wonderful week to really unpack some of the nuances and the ins and outs of of AI, so that the folks that are watching can feel more confident about that in the context of their organizations. And so this first question is really about you know getting more confident in the team context and. The question is this, I'm gonna read it to you and then Jeff, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to, to, to respond to this. So the, the, the questioner says, do we need to get cyber insurance or a product that might help us mitigate AI risk? And so Jeff, as you start off, um, for folks that don't know or haven't heard of this, what is cyber insurance and what is your thought on the specific question that questioner is asking here? So, so cyber insurance, just in general, is really insurance that you would uh, purchase to, to mitigate risk of your organization relative to data breaches and or ransomware attacks or malware attacks inside your organization. And so unfortunately, that happens all the time. Uh, these days, there are a lot of bad actors out there around the world who uh, wouldn't like nothing better than to uh, turn off all of your computers and ask you for money to turn them back on. And so what cyber insurance essentially does is it protects an organization financially uh, in the case that something like that would happen. It also, there are clauses for uh, things like uh, data breaches and, and privacy. I'm sure everybody on the call has gotten at least a letter from at least one organization that said, oh, we lost some of your data. Here's what the data is, et cetera. And so Cyber insurance helps, helps protect those types of situations. Organizations that gather data and have it in their organization that is uh, even remotely sensitive, things like, um, you know, addresses and, um, you know, it's, and I think about the nonprofit space, donor giving history and all of that is very, uh, that's a rich field for hackers to want. In fact, nonprofits, uh, are, are a key target, uh, especially over the last uh, few years as the, as the hackers have gone past some of the low-hanging fruit. 
So that's kind of how cyber insurance works. If you if you know you don't have it as an organization, you probably want to look into it. Um, those organizations that do have it know that it continues to be more rigorous to get it renewed. And when it comes to AI, so, so I'm pivoting to that, when it comes to artificial intelligence, there are there are policies that have clauses in it now for artificial intelligence. I think you're going to see that industry grow and I think it will be incorporated into policies long term. I think the key will be understanding what type of protection you get beyond sort of the data breach. There are things around bias or copyright infringement, et cetera, that you're going to want to just sort of understand. And, uh, you know, there are, you know, it, it, there are, I've seen studies where the market's going to grow significantly over the next 10 years, just in terms of AI being part of cyber insurance. Absolutely. And, um, so a follow up question here, and I'm just thinking about for the folks that have done, for example, homeowners insurance or renters insurance, is this, this product, when we talk about cyber, uh, insurance, is this something that might already be included as part of a larger policy that an organization might already have just in terms of protecting the organization or is it sort of a standalone thing people should be look, looking to invest in? So I'm not an insurance expert, but my understanding is that most of these are actually separate policies from other sort of risk-based insurance products. Okay. Uh, I'm guessing that many insurance providers that provide those other insurance uh, products for organizations would also have a cyber option, whether that's an, an add-on rider or a separate policy, I can't speak to that, unfortunately. Okay. So it sounds like folks need to maybe check out the options that they have available and maybe look into a separate policy altogether if that is what the need is. And, and just like any other insurance uh, product, shop around, understand what you, what the, you know, the risk uh, levels are, what, you know, what the uh, what the costs are versus what you get paid back, all that other, all those other good things about insurance. And so it sounds like if I'm bringing all this together as part of thinking about a comprehensive approach to technology inside of organizations, it sounds like part of the planning is not just about the tools and the people, but it's also about having the right insurance in place. It's also about having a security plan to actually prevent or minimize the risk of some of these things you were talking about in terms of like the ransomware, is that, is that accurate? I think it is. And I, I think that's a good point. And, I, and just bringing back to a topic we talked about earlier this week around governance, governance uh, within your organization means that everybody from a leadership or certainly um, you know, from an organizational perspective has an understanding of what those risks are and what you're doing about it. And, and then really how to manage that because insurance is important. But the key is managing those risks up front. So hopefully you don't need the insurance. Uh, the, the, most organizations don't want to use cyber insurance. They, and all organizations don't want to have to use cyber insurance. Sure. And so the way they get ahead of that is managing those risks and AI and the data and how you use it and when you use it is, is really no different. Absolutely. And so it sounds like for folks that are listening or watching this, if there's nothing else, if you're not able to answer emphatically yes to this question, no matter what level, whether you're a board member, an executive leader, or you're just um, sort of someone in a non-management role, maybe a good question to ask is, do we have cyber insurance, right? And, and how, do we, how do we get that if we don't have it? So um, Jeff, appreciate your thoughts on that. Anything else you wanna add before we move to the next question? No, I just think that that awareness is important. In fact, you're going to hear a a lot of organizations will hear external parties asking them about their cyber insurance, mm. uh, even potentially before they uh, might, you know, work with them. And so uh, it's becoming much more pervasive in terms of the conversation around relationships. So let me act. So one more question comes to mind. So, you know, you at I Bailey, you work with lots of organizations. And is this also a question that organizations should be asking of vendors? like you, like if, if they're working together, like what is what does that look like if we're working on a scope of work and it's an, it's an in-process project, um, is that something folks should be thinking about in terms of is the partner that you're working with, do they have insurance to cover, you know, some kind of breach that might happen in the course of your work together? 
I, I think the short answer is it's not a bad idea to talk about it when you're having those conversations. And certainly it doesn't necessarily need to be a, sort of a, a showstopper in terms of not you know, doing the work with somebody, et cetera. But understanding the risk posture of that organization is, is, is very important. I think another question you may want to ask is really what's, you know, what, how are you going to use data that I share with you? Mm -hmm. Are you going to use it for AI? So it can go both ways. I think you need to disclose when you might use data for AI purposes internally and how you will do it. And I think that organizations need to be okay asking, how are you going to use my data? Uh, in things like AI, et cetera, and what's your, uh, you know, what does your security posture look like relative to cyber risk? Excellent. So two very powerful questions, two very practical questions that I think anyone can sort of raise no matter your level in your organization and get it to the right person. Um, so Jeff, thank you for that, for that wisdom. So we're going to move along to the, the next question that we have here. And so this question reads as follows. It says, as an organization, we have not officially adopted AI. In fact, our tech contractor does not want us to use it. He thinks it will make us he will make our system more vulnerable. I'm seeing staff bring in their personal laptops and use it and then just email text into our system. Help. So there's a lot to unpack in this question as I as I look at it. And I think part of it is maybe understanding what AI is and isn't and what it can and can't do. So Without having more specificity, Jeff, what is your sense of how you might respond to this person? So I think there are a couple of things here. The the first one that we spent time talking about earlier uh, in our series has been choosing the right platforms and and choosing the right scope of how you look at AI. And that's one piece of it. The second piece of it is AI is now pervasive. Anybody with a home computer can go out to chat GPT and ask questions and it magic happens and they get answers. Whether those answers are 100% correct or not is a different conversation, <laughs> but they can do that. And so when they see that, they're like, this is amazing. I really want to be able to use this for making my work more productive, which I think is a, is a good thing. And so the question is, is how do you bring those two pieces together? The, the publisher conversation is really important in the sense that what you don't want to do is exactly what this, this person's asking about relative to just letting people bring their, you know, their PCs in or do the queries on an open source or a, you know, a public large language model. And then you, you just use that internally within the organization. That's not a great idea. And the tech contractor is accurate in saying you shouldn't do that but people are going to want to do it. And so that's where um, as AI becomes more available, more understandable, and people see the benefits in using it and, and understand how they can use it to, to make themselves and their organizations more productive, that's when you really need to think about how do we embed this in a, in a safe, responsible, unbiased sort of way, and how do we start and then grow from there? And so that's why I keep saying platforms and understanding your data and how you're using your data and what data is act, you know, accessible for your AI usage and then use it internally. Start it, you know, light it up and make sure that you know where that data goes when you do use it. Make sure that it's not shared out to a, a, a large language model that then consumes it and learns from it and then may have proprietary data to your organization or, you know, or potentially other, uh, you know, sensitive data that you didn't intend to share. And there are publishers who are being very explicit about your data is your data. Mm -hmm. My guidance when you choose a publisher is understand what is their stance on things like using AI responsibly? Where does your data reside? How is your data used? And when you understand those things, you can sort of narrow down how you get started in terms of choosing a, a starting point for a platform. Mm -hmm. And then you can start your picking a scenario. So I don't think it's something to fear. I think it's something to be planful about and really get ahead of relative to all the things we've talked about this week around data, getting your data right and clean and understandable security 
uh, privacy, internal privacy, and then um, some governance. So Jeff, uh, drilling down just a little bit into this question, is there a distinction that can be made between maybe an individual inside of an organization, let's say like someone who's in communications, for example, that is using maybe a public facing generative AI tool like chat GPT to generate blog post title ideas or to um, help with the first draft of a blog post. Mm -hmm. That seems to be different from maybe a fundraiser inside an organization taking donor data and feeding it into a public sort of open AI tool for analysis. Um, is Do you see a distinction there or you sort of think it's sort of in, in both cases, people should be using a, a specific set of tools that have been sort of formally rolled out inside the organization. Does that make sense? It, it does. And I think it's really around the right tool for the job and the risk. In the first example that you gave, whether, you know, so if it's content creation, some of the richest uses of AI around content creation would include you giving it context about your organization or a program you wanted to write content around, et cetera. If that's not sensitive and you want, and you're okay with that being consumed in a, in a public large language model, then I think that's an acceptable use and that could be part of a governance conversation. If you want it to leverage uh, information that is not public or is more sensitive, that's where you really need to think about um, the big picture. I think the challenge is that understanding when one of those stops and the other starts is where it gets tricky. And so if individuals are just uploading documents to uh, ChatGPT and then asking questions about it or getting responses, those things are training a model in OpenAI. And that is where organizations need to understand what's okay and what's not okay. And, and and then understand what tools are being used and for what purposes. So it sounds like this can be part of the broader conversation inside an organization in terms of, um, you know, what data, what content we're going to be, if we, if, what are the ways in which we're going to say it's permissible to use AI and what data is sort of should remain private, um, you know, in that sense and what is sort of okay for if you are the marketing person, you want to go off and use chat GPT for generating some ideas here and there. So it's like having that, having that explicit conversation can be helpful in terms of giving people sort of guidelines and framework. And then I think the last thing I, and yes, I agree with that. And I think the last piece of that going back to the platform component is you can put up a, a privacy fence around your network and your perimeter as an organization. There are tools that do that. Um, there are platforms that do that today. And having those in place as an organization doesn't mean you can't allow people to do other things relative to their own, you know, but what will happen is, is if they try to do that on your network, it won't allow them to share the data. Yeah. So. And it sounds like part of this is around communication, right? So people don't feel like you're trying to get in the way of innovation or them doing them job doing their job in maybe a more efficient way but it's really about educating hey like we want you to be able to do your job we want you to be able to take advantage of the appropriate tools but we also want to be able to have a shared understanding of what the risks are and how we can work together to mitigate those risks definitely and as we've talked about many times this week it's about people and education is a huge part of that the change management is a huge part of it but that start small and grow from there and bring everybody along for the journey. Help them understand what it is you're doing, exactly why, and then sort of what the guardrails are. Yes. And I think you'll see a lot more uh, individuals embracing it then than sort of fighting it. Excellent. All right. So solid, solid stuff there, Jeff. So we appreciate you for that. So let's move along to the next one that we have here. So this question reads as follows. It says, is there a point where our... Is there a point where we have our team rely too much on AI? It seems simple things like writing email and responding to donors via email should be more personal and not engage AI. Honestly, it seems like one more step that really does not need to be taken. 
And Jeff, as you think about this, I want to share a, a funny anecdote. So I don't know if you watch the, the, there's a sitcom called Abbott Elementary about public school teachers. And a, one of the recent uh, seasons, there was an episode about uh, one colleague who was using AI to respond to another teacher's sort of long meandering emails, right? Because they didn't want to spend the time reading them. And so it became like this whole big thing about <laughs> the person feeling disrespected once they found out that other teachers were using AI to respond to these sort of long, lengthy emails. So Jeff, with that in mind, I'm curious <laughs> what you think about this question in terms of, is there such a thing as relying too much on AI specifically for writing emails and, and doing things that, you know, I guess it's objective that people might feel one way or the other that should be more personalized as opposed to AI driven. I think it's a, it's a great question to sort of recenter uh, on what we began the week on, which is AI as a tool in the toolbox. It's not going to, and this is why I always, when we have the conversations around people worrying about AI replacing their jobs, AI is not going to replace a lot of individual jobs. It will change what they can do in their jobs or how they do their jobs or what sort of creative thinking they can have or or big picture thinking or other activities that they can do. But AI is a tool and AI will bring back answers. And as a person, you it'll bring back content, it'll bring back you know all sorts of amazing things, but we still need to make decisions on them. We still need to read the copy. We still need to validate that the numbers it brings back are accurate through, uh, you know, through validating the sources because good AI tools will bring back all the sources that it's referencing from the large language model and the internet or any, any other internal source that it has. And validating those and then incorporating AI as part of a holistic strategy it, it's not necessarily an additional step. It's a new tool, but it can allow processes to go significantly faster, especially around content creation and some of the things that are really critical for nonprofits. Again, though, to me, you can become too reliant on it. Um, I might call that lazy if you're not validating it. Lazy is more, maybe more of an accurate term than reliant. So yeah. And I, I think of this sort of, I gave you the analogy of the intern, right, earlier in the week, where if you think of AI, sort of the intern, it needs to be trained and you have to provide a direction. Um, it, you know, maybe relying too heavily on the AI could be akin to, you know, someone maybe turning over all the decision making and all of the sort of the key things that need to get done over to the new intern that just joined the team and expecting it to all be great. <laughs> put out the gone fishing sign and hand it over to the intern. That's a bad idea. That's career limiting. So th that, that's the same sort of, and I think that's, a, that analogy is perfect because understanding that you're asking a computer to frame up some things and create things and do things, you still have to check its work. Yeah. So, so Jeff, that, I think that's a perfect lead into this next question, which is, uh, uh, which is a more specific to this point you just made about checking the work. So, uh, this this question reads, when using AI for data review and distillation, how do we know the answers are correct? I'm looking at a huge chunk of data that has been collected by our nonprofit, and I'm trying to determine how confident I should be um, with the answers. Thoughts? I, this is a little bit of a different flavor of AI. Some of the conversations we've been having have been around sort of generative AI and content creation and but this question is a little bit more focused on what it sounds like is internal data. Maybe you've done some algorithms and you wanna really digest what you have internally um, as an organization. And so the thing that we do, uh, that we really suggest for our clients here is clean up your data, make sure it's accurate. That's the first thing. I think the second aspect of that is to, to understand what the scope of the questions you want to ask or what is the data you want to get out of it. And then as you start writing, you know, any sort of algorithms around machine learning to, to digest that data and to leverage it, you can't just try to answer any question all at once on all the data. And so you have this opportunity to understand early results. Is it accurate or is it not accurate? 
If it's not accurate, then you have a problem in your, your model or you have something else that's either causing um, you know, bias or some sort of misinformation from what the data says. And I've mentioned this earlier in the week, AI learns, but we have to teach it what it needs to know. So just like your intern example, they're going to make mistakes. And any good leader who has an intern will coach them, explain what should have happened, what the outcome, you know, the ex expected outcome was. And if you have a good intern, which AI can be a pretty good intern, it learns from it, and then it doesn't repeat the same mistake twice, typically. So that's where we have to be more comfortable with. It's not, again, it's not a magic wand. It's, it's a tool. And sometimes you have to sharpen the tool and you have to uh, do other sort of maintenance to it. And you have to train uh, things, especially if it's your data and you want specific answers around it. There's work to do uh, as you grow your AI in your organization. So I'm hearing you saying that it's, it's a continual process of training and you also have to check the work. And it sounds like maybe a practical way you can do this, maybe ask it some questions about the data that you already know the answer to. Or that you already know are the correct answers. I think that can be sort of one way to to think about this. Um, Jeff, something else that comes to mind too is that it's sort of like if if you were using Excel formulas um, to do data analysis. I imagine that's no different in terms of how you validate and how you think about confidence in 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 large um, you know data sets. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you know, if you have any additional thoughts mm -hmm. um, about that. I think it's it's true, and it, whether it's Excel or you're using Tableau or Power BI or something else to do reporting on your data, it's the classic uh, it's the classic you know, computer science uh, mantra: garbage in, garbage out. If your data is not good, then you're not going to have good results. If your report construction is not good, or the way you've set up filters and parameters isn't good, you're not going to get good results. The same is true of AI. It, you have to understand from a test perspective, here are questions I should be able to ask. Here's what I know the result is. If you're not getting those, then you have to adjust how you're using it. Yeah, and I think it also, I think context is also important here too, right? So are you using it to sort of, I don't know, process feedback on a training to figure out what worked and what didn't work? You just wanna get like a high level understanding of that versus using it to make maybe like a life or death situation. Like I think the context in which you're using the analyzed data, I think also matters as well when we think about that confidence piece. De definitely, and the type of data, how you're using it, how much data there is, how much are you ingesting ver in, in processing versus what you expect. The There's a lot of different variables there. So uh, those are all things to think about as you as you look at sort of accuracy and making sure that you, as you build these things, their quality and that you can trust them. Absolutely. All right, so Jeff, that leads us into our last question that we have for you. And that question is as follows. It says, if we're using AI in our communications, such as annual reports, impact studies, and even newsletters, do we need to declare or disclose that we're using it to generate content? I'm starting to see the opposite with statements like no AI used to write this report. Thoughts, Jeff? So the short answer is you should disclose if you're if you're using AI to generate portions of it. The disclosure, and then you'll at least see that most publishers will say AI was used to generate this or AI generated results may be incorrect, right? It's a great, it's a great way to uh, just sort of make sure that you drive awareness, et cetera. My opinion on this and what I'm seeing is disclosure is important. So you need to disclose AI was used for part of this process. And I think that's okay. I think you're going to see that become much more pervasive over time. You can still put your voice on AI generated content, but it goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is don't just take the results that you get and blast it out to um, you know, the consumer of the content. You need to validate it. You need to make it your own. And I think what you'll see is over time, AI tools will learn your voice better. It'll learn between the prompts you ask and, and the type of response you want. You know, do you want it to be 
um, a whimsical response or a professional response? Do you want it to be, um, you know, how do you, do you want it to be a long answer or a shorter, more concise answer? And those things it will learn from, and it will make you a, actually, in some cases, a better writer, but you still need to put your stamp on that. And I just yeah. think that's going to become much more uh, pervasive throughout all industries as we go forward. Uh, as long as you, again, review it, validate it, and make sure that it's accurate. <laughs> Yeah, and I think on the on the other end of this, in terms of receiving data, like I've I've also seen, you know, where conference organizers might say, you know, um, no AI generated session proposals, right? It's okay to use AI to generate ideas, but please do not use AI to write your session proposal, for example. So I think that there, if for folks that are concerned about that, or maybe looking for making sure that people are sort of being intentional about including that human aspect of it. I think there are also ways to be intentional about setting those parameters. We see that in the example that I just gave. Also in academia, for example, I think there's sort of figuring this out where it's like, well, yes, you can use AI to help you maybe generate the outline or generate some ideas, but don't use AI to write your paper or, or you know. But in, in one way that I've seen AI in that case used very uh, effectively is you write the the content yourself that is unique and your ideas mm -hmm. then you use ai to actually put it into formatting template and get it into the to the way that they want it produced and that can be extremely effective absolutely well jeff this has been an amazing conversation today i know that it's helped folks to get really into the practical and more into the weeds um, and we've had a lot that we discussed this week any parting words before we close out today I uh, no, I mean, I've, I've just appreciated the time this week. It was great to uh, to spend time with you, Miko and, and Julia this week. I've, I've appreciated it. I do think the last thing I'd say just from the nonprofit community uh, collectively is that, I'll, you know, I'll start, I'll, I'll finish the week the way I started it, which is AI is here. It's not something that you should fear and you should really think about how do you embrace it long term, but do it in a way that's, uh, responsible, secure, and everybody's brought on board. Awesome. Well, great, great parting words for us. And so throughout this week, we've had an opportunity to talk about generative AI and nonprofits, preparing your nonprofit for tech success, um, winning with tech and AI, how to get started. And we just answered a whole host of questions specific to all the things that have come up this past week. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to take a listen or watch, or you need to rewatch those, please, Take a look at the archives and and do that we also want to let you know about the ide bailey resourcefulness award so you can check out the website idebailey.com for folks that are interested in that that's coming up for organizations that are interested in participating um, or maybe you just want to watch and see who the who the winners are and be inspired so we invite you to to take your time and and to do that we also just want to make sure that we thank our sponsors we want to thank ide bailey for uh, making this this possible for sharing your expertise and for sponsoring this week we also want to thank our regular presenting sponsors that also make um, every episode of this podcast possible and again go to the nonprofit show.com for more information about the podcast and for uh for this episode and also for for past episodes we want to thank you for joining us we want to wish you a great rest of your week and we look forward to seeing you or hearing from you on next episode Thank you.